for a good morning for me. Um, and I'm uh, I'm Professor James Conrad at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. I am going to talk today about general system design and then software design process. So I'll uh, about an hour, and uh, hopefully I'll get through most of my uh, slides. I want you to add on uh, an idea of what today is going to cover. Um, I showed in our first meeting a uh, an overview of what it is for the uh, design process. Actually, those who are working in embedded system design, um, what they, what they generally do, what they need to know, and what tools they use. This will talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, more information, like what systems they use, uh, which processors, and, and, and maybe some of the environments that they use for uh, uh, creating embedded systems. Then we'll uh, switch to another topic, which is the software and process. Uh, the topic is actually in the book in, in uh, Chapter 5, and I will talk in general about how one develops software for systems, keeping in that at the same time, usually hardware is being developed. All right, let me... Uh, uh, let me switch out of uh, out of this one. I will go to um, presentation. I can see I can see I'm talking about the embedded market study that's up on your screen, correct? All right. Can you find? Oh, you can see the uh, market study uh, on the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So we have some uh, um, study on. Uh, basically, I'm going to show you the um, from the second half of the uh, the study. And it was provided to me by uh, uh, UBM. And uh, they are, are the uh, uh, real good websites and, and uh, online magazines. I would recommend that if you have an opportunity to sign up for these so that you get uh, emails and, and information about uh, how to develop a system. Let's take operating. Now, you have extremely small system. You may not need to have an embedded uh, operating system. Uh, for um, there are many products out there that just have such a small set of or have small code size, and they really need the uh, the function that an uh, that an operating system provides. So, you know, one of the things that asked was was your Use an embedded operating system, a real-time operating system, any sort of kernel, software executive, or scheduler of any kind. It's uh, interesting to note if you uh, take a look at, at uh, um, from uh, 2000, 2015, it's fairly consistent with respect to do they need it or not. Because a lot of the products out there uh, do not need, need it, but we do. So um, you know, you've got twenty-eight percent that do not need it. An example would be um, uh, what are digital watches. Uh, you don't need some operating system for an old digital watch. However, if you do digital watch like uh, my my Apple Watch. Then it's very uh, important to have an operating system because it does a lot of different tasks and it might actually work with a lot of different files. And so you would need some sort of operating system for that. What kind of operating uh, system does it use? Well, here, here is data, and remember, dark blue is, uh, is uh, more recent. And so if you 
the open source OS toss without commercial support would be very akin to uh, free toss or Linux, an open source Linux version. Gain in popularity at the time, commercially available artists and operating systems flying from Green Hills would be or is is uh, fall less and less favor for being used. Also, is that as time fewer fewer companies are actually developing their own in-house operating system or autos. They're far easier to get buy something off the shelf, like uh, or something off the shelf, like an open source autos. Instead, developing their own. So commercial distributions, distributions of open source uh, OSOS, this would be something like Red, that actually uh, gives you support for their uh, for their operating system. Now these are uh, current products, and over here you will see uh, um, futures, and it, uh, uh, more and more people are going to go off to uh, source operating systems and um, even doing the internally developed RTOS. Some of it may, uh, may be uh, different because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the 2018 uh, included a lot more people from Asia, countries China and India. Our same our OS internal. Um, the trend is that, that more people are. Uh, um, the trend is pretty flat. Well, that people are using something that they used previously. They may be switching over to something else. An example would be uh, a company switching from their, um, as we mentioned earlier, their internal their internally developed to one. To, uh, that is no longer internally developed, and so uh, what we're, it might be worthwhile for uh, people working in the field to actually understand several real-time operating systems, real-time operating systems that people use. Well, the bigger here is free RTOS. However, if you take a look at Micrium's MicroC OS. Um, in the 215 survey, if you add up 8% for, for uh, Microsoft OS 3, Microsoft OS 2 at uh, 19%, you have uh, 7%, which would actually make it the most popular, um, which make it most popular RTOS over free RTOS. Now, if you take a look at this and you started adding everything, is that it? adds up to probably a lot more than uh, uh, 1%. And that's because even if you have um, multiple products or that matter, um, a product on that has multiple microprocessors, you're using different systems on the different machines. One thing is that uh, um, Android and Windows Embedded 7 seems to be smaller in uh, um, in use. And again, maybe the, the, the uh, people from Asia and and but then to, to take a look at is that uh, free uh, is literally a uh, a free rating system that you are well use. Freedom's uh, Microsoft OS 2 is really a a system to use to develop code. I believe you have a license uh, to put it into products that are sold. So, in the academic world, actually have free access to to uh, um, my OS operating systems. And in fact, when I teach the Renaissance class. I use that quite a bit. 
and then are people going to go off in the future? Well, it looks like a lot of people are, are going to switch off to uh, Android. Uh, um, uh, that is pretty high, but uh, it went from um, 2014, uh, say 20% to 21%. Uh, two operating systems that have increased uh, quite a bit are the micro CLS. Up, that's now 38% of uh, futurists, which uh, the Korean products are going to be the most uh, popular ones. Microprocessors. And one should point out is that uh, if we look at the, the, um, the space in the past, uh, they are uh, North American centric. And so uh, the respondents who responded in North America. Uh, uh, U.S. more of the U.S. based uh, microroller and microprocessor uh, companies, and so uh, maybe just look at uh, who influences this. If one of the uh, uh, that influences the choice of the processor, it would be uh, either hardware engineering staff or group decision in engineering. Or the engineering managers. And often it's the hardware folks that determine which processor will be used. Um, if you find, you see that there are, then are the software engineering staff, uh, some influence as well in many of the cases. And very often the purchasing manager or the purchasing uh, folks have um, some influence as well, as they'll be more, more than of the cost. This is ready to see it working on a project. How many products are going to be inside of that? Uh, to give you a good example, I think I talked about what, with my Ty Erickson and Sony Erickson. Uh, if we're looking at all the number of processors inside a, uh, a phone, and uh, the 2003 time frame, we have approximately uh, six to ten processors in that device because one processor would be in the power chip. Uh, one processor would be handling digital signal processing. One handling general uh, communications baseband. Uh, the uh, the, the image, uh, that is up on your screen. Um, Bluetooth has a processor out of it. Wi-Fi has a processor in, in, inside. Uh, he has a process or USB chip has a processor inside of it. So a lot of the um, a lot of different projects that you may have may have different chips that it has processors inside and very often you can uh, control things inside of there or even software into them. So still of the uh, have a single mic uh, my processor or microcontroller. But notice that can be multi-core, and so uh, some of the trends that we're seeing also is that uh, uh, you will a, a multi-core chip, which now can handle the USB, which now can handle Bluetooth, the USB stack, the Bluetooth stack, the uh, uh, 11 stack, and, uh, and you'll see that, that there will be fewer and fewer individual chips because they're integrating more of the functionality. you a, uh, uh, idea that very often you have different vendors to serve families in a particular project. You'll also have the possibility of uh, programmable gate arrays in addition to uh, chips in your, uh, in your process. So FPGA with a uh, uh, software uh, processor core uh, will be included in your design. So, what, how are these processors? Of course, uh, when first microprocessors and microcontrollers came out, they were uh, 8 bit processors. And so, uh, since they first came out, I first used mine in, in uh, 
And so what are you familiar with? So if you look at all of the uh, possible events here, a lot of people are familiar with uh, Texas Instruments. I believe we actually use the MSP430. Uh, at everybody's familiar with the uh, Reno, uh, which uses Atmel chips. Uh, Freestyle, which is the former Motorola chip. ST Micro, or Sitel, working their way, ways down. Renaissance is at uh, the 29 cent. Uh, Renaissance actually claims to be the uh, company that ships the highest number of microcontrollers in the world. Uh, probably associated with the fact that it's in, in an awful lot of automobiles and electronics that are developed in Asia. Uh, of course, to examine which are the uh, uh, that you're currently using and Texas Instruments is on top free scale at Mel um, microchip. And Wave uh, Xilinx is, is pretty identified as a FPG company, as is Altera. <coughs> Excuse me, where are you going to be using for uh, uh, your next device? These are top 20, and Texas Instruments and Freescale and ST Micro are up in the uh, like this, make the, uh, the people at uh, Texas Instruments have been nervous when they notice that uh, their market might actually go down. Uh, which uh, speaks for itself. In, in other words, in Asia, um, of the uh, response report that upgrade from an it to a 32 bit. And uh, the important thing to note is that uh, because now more respondents from Asia get a good flex going on in the entire world. Since a lot of the uh, in Asia are, are getting uh, new products that are consumed all over the world. My program uses FPGAs, and so uh, as uh, uh, one of the courses, is that correct? Box, so I'll uh, assume the answer is yes. But it's interesting to note that, uh, when asked, does your current embedded project contain a uh, FPGA or any sort of programmable logic? Uh, sir is you know, approximately uh, uh, two thirds say no, and and it's actually the trend is less and less. And we could see this is because microcurs are becoming more and more and more feel and their capabilities um, allow to do a lot of things now. They have more memory, they run faster, and so the reasons why. Design used FPGAs in the past, the speed and the uh, ability to uh, configure on the fly are, uh, are lessened, and microcontrollers are becoming a better option for, uh, for embedded systems. So, if you look at the takeaways from all the microprocessor uh, slides that I just covered, these uh, uh, the important aspects like the top five vendors, TI Atmel, Freescale, Microchip, ST Micro, uh, top vendors uh, starting to use TI Freescale, ST Micro, Microchip, and Atmel. In other words, same, uh, the same companies show up on all three of the familiar with currently being in con uh, or currently being in considering to use, which means. Um, if you want to develop um, these embedded systems all over the world, it would be handy to understand the T products, things like the MSP430 or the 432 series um, of microprocessors, the uh, ATAS, 
the H megas, the uh, rescale uh, historical ones, and no, not in, included in there anywhere is uh, Intel. So even though the Intel 851 was a very popular chip in the past, uh, not very many people are actually using that in the future. And so uh, valuable to know that 32 bits are as uh, uh, the other um, chip available, for example, uh, DSP. And let's go on to hardware IP, intellectual property system level design, and the of movies, uh, in other words, tools. Develop, create new projects. Very often, what they're doing is they're just using hardware and hardware intellectual property from a previous. In other words, a lot. Of, a lot of the projects worked on today are are just revisions. And I think I mentioned this in the uh, in the last. If you are um, actually creating the Apple iPhone eight. Uh, typically, with the Apple iPhone 7 and the hardware base, and you might make modifications. For example, you use a new processor that is uh, become available, the same family as the iPhone 7, but you want to use the new chip, which is faster, has more memory, um, more features. So uh, the answer here depends over the years. Um, it's pretty, it only goes up, up and down a couple of percent uh, that they're creating brand new hardware. Or uh, 60% or so, yeah, you reuse some hardware that was developed in house. And you think that was the You have to, it's very expensive to design and then build it and see if it works. So it is very important to be able to model some or all in a uh, simulation tool or perhaps even a VHDL tool, or a hardware design uh, tool. We actually implement it in the real world. So this shows you there are a lot of actually uh, uh, working with simulating their entire project or their uh, art products to actually go out and build it. Now, one of that uh, these organizations use in some Fast fabricating or fast uh, prototyping um, tool to uh, for a uh, if, if different algorithms will work. work uh, able to, for example, in MATLAB, they're able to test if their particular applications uh, will, work, and then they actually port that to a code that they could run on their microcontroller. Uh, Last, another fast prototyping tool, very graphical user is. I am not sure if your uh, your school there uses LabVIEW or MATLAB, but uh, our university here, we actually use uh, MATLAB and, and LAB extensively for the development of, of the system. So others, including Simulink, uh, uh, and then uh, on down different uh, tools available. This, these level tools that are totally influenced by the software developers who uh, want to use uh, a generic development environment to validate their algorithms, their ideas, their digital signal processing uh, work that they're actually. Developed and 
implement downloaded into their uh, their specific microcontroller. There are different environments. We have, in example, there is a tool called uh, Mio in the U.S. I'm not familiar if you use it there, but the National Instruments has this uh, uh, which has a very rich set of uh, input ports, and you can actually program your entire embedded system in lab view, including handles and uh, processes data. You can verify it on a PC in which you develop it, and then you can download the application to my Rio uh, We have actually uh, several autonomous vehicles that use that my Rio board to handle everything from motor control to uh, uh, location and using cameras, actually controlling the uh, um, uh, patient of the cameras using the, uh, the input ports for middle input and the uh, output ports to uh, drive motors. Now, embedded system, you cannot uh, forget about the project management aspects of, of doing a project. When we are students how to develop embedded systems. We actually have them identify these that they will follow for a relatively large project. In other words, what are the major functionalities that you will uh, that you will develop and estimate each one of those will take to uh, a level design, a low level design, implement and then test. And the, a lot of uh, people use Excel just to uh, use this. Microsoft Project is a very complex tool, but a very good tool if you understand it. Use video and then other tools as you go down. Um, IB Project Doors is actually a, yeah, a request type of can also be used for uh, project. It is so too that whenever you develop an embedded system, a very is not just by one or two people. It is the, uh, a team of, of 14 to 15. And so if you need to, uh, uh, several people potentially touching individual uh, C or CC or INC files, any sort of file, you know, you to ensure that. Um, you keep copies of old versions in case the new version doesn't work right. And so, virtual control is a, uh, a way to do that. It, it, it works very much like a library where you um, you have your code in a central place, and developers will check out and lock a certain uh, file that they will use. They will be uh, the version of code that associated with the single uh, one file. They'll make modifications. They'll test it, verify that it works, and then check it back in as a new version of code that other people then can use when do their, their own development. Some of the Git and CPS are some of the uh, popular ones. Um, I've used uh, PPTS or TVS and uh, subversion. In I know that in the, uh, the development of embedded systems, we're more using some sort of graphical user. The tip that I want to mention is that uh, if you develop embedded systems in, uh, in the real world, it would probably be very valuable for you to, to uh, understand lab, lab view as well as uh, MATLAB, especially. Keep in mind that uh, most people will be doing uh, development of software and eventually become the T 
teams, you will need to understand project management. And so understanding not only the project management tools, but also the concepts associated with project management is going to be very helpful. So um, that is it for this particular uh, of what I'm going to talk about today. I'll open up for questions before I move on to the software development model. Our questions. So the next set of slides is going to be on the uh, engineering for embedded systems. For those who, who uh, looked at my web page for embedded systems, I actually have recorded this previously, and uh, this is available um, as well. And I sent these back off to your instructor. The main premise of this is to discuss the need for structured development of software. Uh, one doesn't start writing code on so the keyboard uh, and, uh, and hope it all works. You actually need to follow a process in order to verify that all of your efforts are going to be uh, successful and that you don't spend a lot of time testing. Uh, you use some development gradually and verify that it all, all works before you continue on. And so I'm going to go through some of our software development uh, stages. Again, what's before this is that uh, uh, all products delivered have bugs. And understand that, yes, every single embedded system that has been delivered Large or small, uh, large small packets have bugs in them. Some more bugs per line of code than others. And the way to ensure to reduce the number of bugs that you have in your code is to have a structured process by which you can validate small pieces of code as completely as possible and as fast as Some of the process. First of all, when you think about an embedded system, you will typical life cycle that, that you see here. Uh, the, uh, entrepreneurial, smart, or uh, uh, savvy people will see there is a particular need or opportunity that needs to be addressed. An example would be, uh, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, their toy called the Tamaguchi. Have you thought of that? And I can't hear you, so I'm going to assist you understand what it is. It's a small little device. It has a very simple screen. Uh, what it is, it's a virtual path. And so virtual path, little keychain-like device, um, was a that was uh, I believe developed in, in created in, in, uh, developed in Japan and for a while here in the U.S. It was very popular. Some um, smart people said I can develop this system that had a couple buttons and a screen. This concept, the hardware and the software associated with it. I should say at the same time that they designed the product, they actually, uh, uh, oops, back up there, the manufacturing process of how they make it. And once they were happy with the software and the hardware that they designed, perhaps they developed prototypes and tested it, then they went to full production, deployment would be shipping and selling to uh, organizations that 
would buy and sell it in their stores. So they are very popular in, in toy stores in the, in the U.S. And also, uh, after a while, you can even buy these in grocery stores. They have then be to support and maintain their their products. In other words, uh, um, they make the there was a bug that they had to fix. And they would come up with product rated, but eventually got tired of these little toys, and they would uh, they would uh, down their production, and uh, perhaps they would find that there was a new need for a new product. Maybe this uh, this new need would be in a small little embedded system on a keychain. Perhaps they would make a furry little creature. They would do the same thing with. It would be another me. By the way, that is called the Furby. So uh, maybe they would continue this cycle. So if we look at the of developing, I'm here the model for software development, but they're actually identical to one. Uh, the hardware development, you will have the same type of uh, requirements, analysis, and specification, and hardware architectural design, the hardware detail design. This is no longer, this is not thing. This is the actual prototyping or the uh, uh, development of a hardware board enclosure ever. ever. And along the integration, Integrate hardware and software together. And so, in the model, it's important to note that any path starts with requirements. Requiring saying what this product will do from the respect of performance, operation, or uh, for that matter, uh, environmental, operum. Use all sorts of requirements that one can develop for a product, and people have to identify the specification of the device. You'll get into um, what processor or microcontroller will be able to handle that requirement that we created. What sort of uh, um, LCD will handle the requirement? Do we need a keyboard? Do we need a uh, just a bunch of buttons? And what of uh, uh, closure do we need for a product? A sort of uh, operational software uh, will need to be used. Will you need to use USB, 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 or will you need to use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? Once the specification. Then we'll uh, identify your software architecture. In other words, how are you going to organize large blocks of functionality? Then you detail. By the way, architectural design is more of high-level design. Design would be things like flowcharts or pseudocode. In other words, how the individual function might, uh, might work. And then at the bottom is coding. There are a couple of want to point that are extremely important to at every point must have a review and maybe larger reviews of specifications because it is the specifications published examined by all the uh, all stakeholders the people who are going to be Developing as well as the people who are going to be trying to test, maybe even solve or sell the product. It's going to have everybody review what has been done to ensure that there are no mistakes and no bad assumptions as they go forward. Because then imagine if they finally get into coding and discover that the uh, um, one of the things could not be met by the particular that was selected further up, 
then to back up and we do a lot of work to problem that was found down below. Whereas if the software developers had been involved up earlier, they might say, what you're trying to do is not possible on this on this particular microprocessor running at this particular speed. So it's all you have, have peers, you get the problem. That with every step in the development or embedded system, there is also a corresponding test step. The final test here will validate the specific requirement specifications that are developed over here. Very often, the test organization will take the specification and the function organization will write the specific test at the same time as the requirements are, uh, are written and specified. And two is that the functional test would have a peer review as they're being written at the same time. The inner tests are at the same time as the architectural architecture is designed. Uh, this level of integration test is written the same uh, time detail design and then the soft unit testing uh, this is are actually uh, written time that the software is coded. For IBM and Ericsson, um, when I were uh, IBM many, many years ago, we were software uh, unit testing and then integration Test at them, and these tests were reviewed by the software developers. So we ensured that the uh, that the software would be actually testing the right paths through the code. Let's look for development stage. We dissolve before coding, include peer review, system architecture, uh, design implementation, and support test. Should so that every team member has a clear idea of what product will do and what the uh, what the operation and uh, and also what, what will be inside of the product with respect to hardware as well. You could express them in text or graph, but they need to include uh, required language like shall or should or must. And there are requirements, functional requirements, and general constraints. Now, um, I believe stop, and we actually write some requirements. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to do that. But I could give you some examples. I'm going to pause right now uh, for this. Example of some software requirements that I have implemented for and take a, a good example of, of last word last semester. You are actually looking at a uh, PDF file. And uh, in my file, even though questions are what to do, oops, this is not the file that I want. Here I have an example of some requirements that I have for, for a particular assignment. Oh, by the way, the assignment is that the students will use, in this case, the uh, the Renaissance RX 63N board. From the board, they will create an oscilloscope, which means they will need to use a uh, 
um, the digital input. They'll need timers. They'll also need the LCD to be able to put information up on the screen. And I say I have to use uh, C and C++. They need to use the input from a waveform generator instrument that we had in our lab. We did form would be between 0 and 3.3 volts. The what they wanted to hear and then report had to be within 10% of the signal. And we said that the signal is going to be a square wave or a So um, for the waveform had to be identified. The uh, um, and we had to uh, just the actual shape of the wave as well. Um, uh, uh, the accuracy of the frequency had to be plus or minus five. That example of how we would uh, um, how we use. Be able to uh, then design. All right, let's do our, uh, our uh, presentation. So you have to design the entire system as well because having just the requirements is what you need to deliver. In other words, very often a company, if they're in a Work product or a uh, system for another company. Uh, requirements are the contract of what you're going to deliver before you code because it saves time working a code and it helps you to organize and do a uh, um, a which we call um, oh. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, what I was going to say. Um, in other words, you break the problem down into smaller, smaller pieces. And get to a smaller piece. It's uh, easy to design, easy to implement, and easy to test. I have the importance of peer review, and so the uh, peer review will help you identify oversights and misconceptions at each one of the steps. The other is that having a peer review, you also can identify those, uh, parts of the design and those modules that might have a little bit more problem than others. For example, if you are doing uh, um, the module on, on, on communication that have been uh, Written by, uh, for example, Sheesh. And uh, it turns out that uh, Sheesh's module on communication during a peer review have, have found with many, many, many problems. Uh, so had bugs, design had uh, uh, understandings and misconceptions. Um, one that would be very suspect in the future lots of code and should be very closely and tested very, uh, very heavily later on. It will uh, help you identify not only the processor and peripherals, but to divide the software into the major, uh, for example, uh, these, these major functionalities over here, over there, will be uh, the communications and these Important functions over here will be handled by the LCD, and so we'll have several uh, LCD modules that might uh, actually format the screen. Uh, one format the screen, another will actually uh, see the formatted screen data to the screen itself. Um, these would be different. We actually develop the system architecture and then divide it up. What we divide and conquer. Product. You get small enough um, identification of a design. I can say uh, I was 
what the inputs of this function would be and the outputs of this function would be, then write the, uh, the detail line using their pseudocode or a flow chart. Uh, but uh, at this point in time, you'll also be able to identify uh, if an interrupt service routine is needed. And of course, interrupt service routines don't have data passed into them, but they use but they would gather data from either uh, input devices or, or maybe uh, memory locations where information is stored. Uh, um, this is uh, this will, uh, a. We had a robot. In a where and so if you look at this um, flow chart that we say uh, go forward for three seconds and, uh, make turn and at this point uh, what it is we're uh, we're one complete square where the bot will go straight for three seconds and then make a return for point four seconds. Finally, the, uh, the detail design will be the, the steps that you can then actually translate directly in code. As shown earlier, C is the most dominant programming language for embedded systems. Code be generic and clear because chances are that the software that you write will be uh, mined by one or two or maybe many other people time. For example, you may go on to a new project and, and you have to uh, have, uh, somebody else maintain the code and fix any bugs that might be found. So that, when you're actually implementing software, C, or any other programming language, uh, it is not to your advantage to get uh, as few lines as possible because uh, the equivalent amounts of code uh, using 10 lines and 20 lines that pile to the same amount of objects. And yet it may turn out that the 20 lines that you wrote are much more readable and easier to understand. Also keep in mind that no comments are not uh, compiled into the code. So it's very important to include lots, lots and lots of comments in Find other guides for module on testing, which I may not uh, uh, teach you, but depending on your instructor if he wants to. Test is the way to uh, try and find as many bugs as possible. Software testing doesn't verify that there are no bugs. There will always be bugs in code. It's to verify that there are as few bugs as possible. There's a box test. Testing, which will test see the functionality of the software, We're knowing what's going on inside, in other words, the flow of the individual functions, and then the white box test that relies on the knowledge of brand within the uh, software module. And testing is very important to be, in fact, that's one of the prominent ways that a for developer will a test and validate their own software that they have written. Black box testing will be done by another organization that uh, wants to validate how the entire product works. By the curve, the past, are fixed. They actually, the, the test case that found that should actually be run, rerun to ensure that the bug has truly been fixed doesn't back up again in the, the uh, future, and that's called regression testing. Uh, I've probably got another two minutes to go, so I'm just going to keep on going. There are development uh, or what we call life cycle models to uh, to go. just to introduce some of these uh, quickly. Oh, and that's where you do everything appropriate, everything. Uh, in a, and 
want. So you identify the user needs, the requirements, you design, you build, you test, and you deliver the product. This we also call the TADA, um, TDA method, uh, or as we say in uh, the world of Meta, uh, which is actually a bad way of developing a product. In this, you are doing everything that and an understanding what the user needs up front. And the next time the user sees something is all the way at the bottom when you deliver them the product. Ta-da, here's your product. Do you like it? Um, very often, um, a user wants to see the progress because they may not really know what they want. So to provide them some interim results so that they could see how the product is going. And there's another way, and it's it. By the way, um, I apologize. This should be more of a sawtooth, very much like this, again and again and again. Um, and this is UI, some functionality that the, uh, that the user will want to see. You want that functionality, show it to the user or the customer, and say, is this similar to what you want to see in your end product? It will be all the functionality, but it will tell you. The user will look at that and say, oh, I like that. I don't like that. I like that. I don't like that. And then you will deliver another version, which has corrections to the first delivery and has additional functionality. You show the customer again. So now I've gone a little bit further. You like this? you don't like this, they'll say, oh, I like this, I like that, thanks for doing that, and I think that should be changed. And perhaps your third delivery is the final one. There might be minor changes after that, but what you is you're not just delivering one thing all the way at the end and hope the customer likes it. They input it as time goes on. There's a process in which you aren't sure what needs to be done. And so you will acquire objectives, constraints, alternatives. You evaluate uh, using prototype. Um, you prototype. You'll to the uh, to the customer, the user, and uh, and they'll say things like um, uh, that's to what I want, or um, they're not even close. So I was thinking more like uh, some something over like that. And then you just keep on doing and, and each time actually learning more and more and more about the process. This is on a very, very new product spaces that don't have anything that has ever been done before. And uh, what you're trying to do is, is, is get closer to what a, an eventual customer will purchase. Other uh, products use what's called Agile Development process in uh, things like extreme programming, lean development, and uh, again, methods to speak to the, to the customer as, as possible. And very often, um, uh, some are actually um, probably be sold or implemented. And every you go through a, a uh, uh, Sprint, you're doing more and more functionality. By the way, other agile development uh, methods include um, uh, programming. Uh, there is a situation or the development process by which two developers will sit at one computer and, believe, of course, only one has their fingers on the keyboard at a time, but they will actually talk between the two people as they develop the software. You know, it's signed, and so when they implement it, they develop it at the same time. The end of that is that at, at developing the software, they're going through a peer review process and show it in many applications that it is a better use of two people's time rather than having one person develop one piece of code there, one person develop the other piece of code over there, and then get them to work together. Um, both, both 
both people develop both pieces of software at the same time, uh, they find that you spend less time, less man hours developing the product. Uh, the way of is a valuable way of uh, if something is not. So when I worked for Ericsson and Sony, and we were developing phones, uh, we would uh, do what we would call multiple turns of the hardware board and add more software as we went along. So we use a uh, iterative, a spiral type of process. We would develop what we thought was all the hardware. We would find different types of problems. For example, oh my gosh, we discovered that our processor was working fast enough. And so switch out a processor and put this family in, but a higher frequency uh, clock running, which means we had to change the clock uh, shell, or I should say the oscillator as well. And then we also had to do uh, uh, validation simulation. With a box, or maybe developing the phone, we found out that we needed more RAM memory, and so we had to switch out one particular RAM device and put another one in. If it was needed uh, more S lines, and so we had to make some minor changes. The though is that we would develop the phone and we would use it for a little bit, and then we would just throw away. And we would have a prototype build, which modification of the, the previous one. But we had more and more functionality. So, we the mock, uh, went through the development requirements stage, is actually the most, most important because if you don't know what you're going to build, you don't know how you're going to build it. And you're actually going to test it, deliver it. So, the requirements and assessing the requirements are very important up I went through the, the, the value of peer review. And finally, we, we looked at a couple of processes for developing the software. That is the presentation. I would like to uh, now open it up for questions. Again, what does it mean? I think you said what it is uh, very much as it sounds. It is uh, it is developing uh, software very quickly, uh, often using off the shelf um, parts and components, and um, it's using very often it's using agile type processes. So um, usually. Just a general term for uh, various developments using process like uh, like Agile and, and uh, Spring. Uh, Any questions? Yeah. All right, so uh, I would like to thank you all again for uh, for this uh, uh, this presentation. And, uh, I will see you uh, uh, next at about the same time. And, uh, have a good evening. In fact, uh, thank you for the time. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.